Hi guys, and welcome to the first mock exam that we'll be going through on the Scholar Hall YouTube channel for Code Runner Java. Uh, these questions are extremely similar to the past questions that have been sat in exams, and hopefully after this video you will have a very comprehensive understanding of the type of questions you'll be getting in Code Runner One and how to approach them. This will be the first test uh, out of hopefully many on the channel, and uh, after every question. I will explain when you can pause it and you can attempt the question yourself in your own job or project on Eclipse. Uh, you should begin by typing the code that you see in the white box below you. Um, so that import java.util.arraylist will be important for the final question on ArrayLists and the uh, functions that you're calling within the main, make sure that instead of just putting the variable names in there that you're putting actual values um, and then create your methods where you see that comment below the main. Um, obviously make sure that as you're testing them before uh, you go on to see the solution that you're commenting the ones that you haven't already done out uh, to avoid there being an error when you're running your code. Uh, but without further ado, let's get to this. So for question one, we are to write a method called do a test that takes in four parameters of the type integer and returns true if z is larger than x and a is equal to b. If those conditions are not met, return false. Use the following function prototype when writing the method, public static boolean do a test int a int b x and z. So have a go at that and after you pause it and finish, I'll be here to help. Right, so you should have had a go at that question. We can have a look at the solution now. So we've used our function prototype at the top and for the eventuality that z is larger than x and a is equal to b, remember to use the double equal sign and the comparator double and for and and your brackets for your if statement and your braces as well, all things you should remember, return true for that eventuality. For all other eventualities, return false. Now here's one thing that people often forget about conditional statements is that every condition must be accounted for. So for every condition that could possibly happen within this conditional statement, something must be returned. And the way we do that is by providing an else statement, not just if and else if, because you aren't covering all your bases there. So we're going to make sure we have an if, and we always end with an else statement to cover all other eventualities. So we're returning false for any other eventuality than what was already defined as should have been true. So if you got that answer, well done to the next question. So for question two, we're going to be writing a method called hello person that takes in the string parameter person and returns the string. Hey there, person, where person is the string value of the parameter person. That sounds really complicated, but in essence, what it is, is that when you call your function hello person and an example string Jerry is given, it should return hey there Jerry exclamation mark. So you need to use the following function prototype. Uh, if you don't understand it, just try and read it again and understand it. But if you do, go ahead and give it an attempt. So you should have attempted that by now. So let's have a look at the solution. So we've got public static string hello person. And I've created a string called x. And I've concatenated three strings together. Hey there, with that space. It's absolutely critical you have that space, otherwise it will be wrong. And I'm adding our variable person of type string that we're going to be adding in. So we had Jerry in our example above. And if it was, it would be hey there, space, Jerry, exclamation mark, exactly as it is here. And that is how I do it. Now, I have seen it being done with a return statement one line return and then it just writing that. I don't personally know if that works. Uh, if it does, feel free to drop a comment, but I don't know if it does. I just prefer to keep it safe and keep it structured and do it like that. Uh, but if you have a, another better method of doing that, then by all means stick to it. So that's how you go about doing that. It's literally as simple as that. And that is the kind of question that you're going to get around printing strings. So without further ado, let's move on to the next question. 
Right, question three. We need to be um, familiar with for loops and nested for loops. So if we're not, go and visit the ScholarHall YouTube channel or ScholarHall.com and have a look at how to do them. Because if you're not familiar with them, you're going to find this question rather challenging. So we need to write a method called make a sequence that takes in a parameter that is a single integer a and produces a string sequence of the following form a repeated a times, a minus 1 repeated a minus 1 times, all the way to 1 being repeated once. And an example is given where if we have make a sequence 4, it would return 4 4s, 3 3s, 2 2s, and 1 1. So if our value of a is less than 1, an empty string should be returned, and it is specified within the examination paper that that is not the same as returning null. So we need to be using the following function prototype, public static string make a sequence a. Uh, apologies, that should be int a. But uh, if you feel comfortable in going ahead with that, do go ahead with it, and I'll explain it after. So we should have had a good swing at that question, so let's have a look at the solution. So we've got public static string make a sequence int a. If a is less than 1, we're going to be returning our empty string as per specified and for all other eventualities we are creating two variables of type integer and we're going to be using these for our for loops. We have our empty string theta that we're going to be adding to and we have our outside for loop where i is going from our input parameter value a all the way down to 1 and it's going to be going down by one each time, and within that we have a nested for loop where j goes all the way from one all the way up to our value i, and it goes up by one each time, it increments by one each time, and each time it increments it's going to be printing our value i to our string theta. Now that may seem complicated, but if we look at it logically, so in our example where we had make a sequence four, returning 4, 4s, 3, 3s, 2, 2s, and 1, 1. If our value of a was 4, the following would happen. So we'd have i is equal to 4. Before it goes down by 1, it's going to go within this nested for loop, where i is equal to 4. j is going to be equal to 1. And it's going to go all the way up until j is equal to i. So j is equal to 4. So all the way from 1 to 4 incrementing by 1 each time, and you can imagine that when i is equal to 4, and then j is equal to 1, it prints 4, and then j is equal to 2, it prints 4 again, and then j is equal to 3, it prints 4 again, and then j is equal to 4, it will print 4 again, but now j is no longer less than or equal to 4, so it's going to go out to this outer 4 loop again, where i is going to go down by 1 to 3, and their cycle is going to go again. So now we're going to go from j is equal to 1 to j is equal to 3, because our new value of i is 3. And we're going to go j is equal to 1, so we're going to print 3. j is equal to 2, so we're going to print 3. j is equal to 3, and we're going to print 3. And it's going to go round for 2 again, and so on. So that is how our nested for loop works. And our empty string theta will be filled up with the string that you can see right here if our value of a is equal to 4. So we're going to be returning that string outside of our for loop. It uh, seems logical enough. We would not put that inside our for loop primarily because any code you have after your return statement becomes invalid. Your return statement is the final item of code you have within your code block. Uh, everything after that will not be executed. So you don't want it inside an iterating for loop, uh, primarily because any iteration after the first iteration won't happen. So you want to outside where your end string will be returned. Um, and we're returning a string, so that's perfectly correct. If you got that answer correct, well done. And we'll move on to the next question now. So this is question four, and I myself have adapted this question. Uh, the base question you'll get around arithmetic in Java will be extremely simple. Uh, the original question around this said this create a method called do a calc that takes in three parameters of type double and returns this sum right here this equation 
it didn't say any of this it just gave you your function prototype and asked you to do that which i thought was extremely boring so i've asked you to create alternative conditionals to avoid mathematical errors by returning 0.0 if you deem it necessary so if you think any mathematical errors can be formed out of that uh, do create a conditional to return 0.0 if that's the case and the name of your prototype should be do a calc create your own function prototype and create its body to return a variable of type double so uh, try that out and let's see how you do all right so hopefully you had a firm understanding of that and you've got the answer that you can see before you where you've got public static double do a calc and you've got your three input parameters here of type double and I created my eventuality where either x is equal to minus y, which would result in a denominator being zero, or z is equal to zero. Now I'm sure you only need one or the other of that because this kind of is actually equal to 200.5z over x plus y, so you really only need that one. But uh, well, I just cover all bases because why not, right? You could just put it in anyway. So. We're going to return zero and it would be zero anyway so that's awesome and then else i've created a variable of type double called solve short for solution and i've got my equation right here and i'm returning it so if i didn't give you that extra work it would have literally been this right here this simple little solution and what i kind of like to remember is don't just return that create a variable assign it that equation and return that variable. Please remember to do that. Don't just return that. It's likely to be wrong. I've tried it, it's been wrong. So uh, just keep with this format right here and you're bound to stay at 100%. So if you've got that right again, fantastic. You seem to be doing really well. If not, then there are support videos on Scholar Hall's YouTube channel. Do check them out. And uh, also, for your code runner exam, I'll direct you towards a page on Scholar Hall where you've got all your mathematical operators and comparators all there for you to see and use during your exam. But without further ado, let's go on to the next question. So we have our fifth and final question uh, surrounding array lists, um, which says write a method called make this sequence that contains in the parameter t of type integer and contains an integer array list containing data in the following form. Wow, that's a mouthful. T repeated t times, t minus one repeated t minus one times, all the way to one repeated one. So literally exactly the same format of question as we had in our previous sequences question. I believe that was question three. So uh, this does look extremely familiar where, again, make this sequence six would return six sixes, five fives, four fours, three threes, two twos, and one one. And again, if our value of t is less than 1, we're going to be returning an empty array list. Again, this isn't the same as null, and we're going to be using the below function prototype. So give that a go, and let's see how you do. All right, so you should have given that a go, and this is the answer I got. So we've got public static array list, integer, uh, make this sequence with our input parameter t. And we've initialized our, and created our array list of type integer called x right here and it's empty and we've got our eventuality where if t is less than one then we're just returning that empty array list straight away as per the specification else for every other eventuality we are literally following the exact same format as our previously discussed sequence uh, with one minor difference so we are just instead of um adding it to the value, uh, adding it to the string in the way we did before. Um, we're just going to do x dot add i. And that's the syntax that we're using for array lists. And that's the only difference. I feel like this exam paper that had these questions was just asking to see if you knew your syntax around your array list, because that's how you add an element to an array list. Again, if you're unfamiliar with how to manipulate array list, it's definitely worth checking out one of the videos, they're not long, on Scholar Hall's YouTube channel. And that will explain exactly how to go about doing this. And again, we're putting our return statement, returning our array list right outside the for loop. Uh, but that is the end of the examination. I hope that you've 
understood or learnt something from this video. If not, then uh, do drop a comment or email me directly at justask@scholarwall.com, and I'll be happy to send you any material or to adjust my content accordingly. But that's typically the kind of questions that you're getting that is an actual exam past paper. Um, so if you found that easy, then you should find the rest of the questions that I'm going to be putting up easy. And if you found that difficult, then I do have content existing that's up to help you with your understanding around this. So if you have any further questions, feel free to email me or contact me. Uh, otherwise, good luck with your studies and I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye.